Well, folks, it's time to kick it old school. Uh, so you can feel cool. <laughs> Give it to me, baby. <laughs> baby. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the Miles and Crawford Variety Hour. Yet again this week, we're talking about the opiate epidemic and uh, how it affects people today on all sorts of life and how it affects society um, politically. Um, what kind of things can we do to raise awareness? Maybe what kind of legislation do we need to pass? What can we do to overcome this epidemic? Um, I think... The opiate epidemic has really hit our generation especially hard. Um, our generation fought in the Iraq war, and we lost a lot of young men during that time. Um, and then, you know, we have the opiate epidemic or crisis. And what can we do to talk more about the support systems that people are getting? For example, um, I know several people who have lost their fiancés, husbands, uh, to a heroin or an opiate overdose. And it's very sad to watch people have to go through that. And a lot of them hide, like in the obituary, they don't want to talk about it. And that's something that I think we need to talk more about if you lose a loved one to an uh, opiate overdose or a heroin overdose. And I th I'm just saying opiate just to kind of cover heroin and pills because I don't want to have to keep going back. And, you know... I so, <laughs> I can't. you can't even. Uh, uh, I lose my train of thought so easily. It's ridiculous. I, I was trying not to be so ranty McRanger said this. Time. I know. I could feel it coming at me. Like, I was ready for you to break in, and that's fine. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? You know, I mean, all the people that you, know, you you read the obituaries or you see on Facebook, rest in peace. I mean, it's affected everybody. I think it's one of those things where we can't quim. How many more times are you going to see rest in peace? So sorry that we lost you. Uh, make sure that you're carrying your Narcan on you. Here's my thing. Like, just be honest about everything in the full fledge in the first place. Like, I think... Everyone dying of heroin isn't something that is shocking or that it's it's unknown. I feel like we understand what's going on about it, and however, we don't. <sighs> that you're completely right, Crawford. When it comes down to putting that in the obituary, you see these people who are being called strong because they're being open and they're talking about how, you know, their kid or their loved one or their friend was taken by this, you know, terrible epidemic and they tried to seek help and there wasn't enough help out there and addiction is addiction and there's there's no way else. And I, you know, and that's one of those things where I, I see the one side of you where it's, you know, it's addiction and never going to be able to overcome it and they're just feeding into everybody else joining the group. You're like... Right. They're helping other people stay addicted because they need a partner in it. Right. And uh, it goes along with that meme I think we all saw where, you know, uh, it's amazing how, you know, people with uh, you start doing drugs or doing it because other friends are doing it. But when they die, they die alone. Right. And, and it's because people think that it's a friendly drug or all their friends are doing it and maybe they are. And at the same time. Some people are just suffering, right. just to suffer, and that's just who they are, and their addiction is overcoming. So they do need help, and we shouldn't just let them die. And should our taxpayer monies go to Narcan? Should it go to all these things? And absolutely, unless you really are trying to do crowd control. Right. If you don't want cops or, or EMTs or sheriff departments or firefighters to carry Narcan, you don't want them to carry that just because you are literally trying to create a crowd control. But just because you kill everybody, if you don't give anybody who's help on heroin, where are your great stories going to come from? Where are you going to get, you know, a lot of these people who have overcame it have these great stories and they are rebuilding their lives and they are having children and they're going to teach their kids about why not to do drugs and their own stories and their own situations. And so you've got to give people another chance. But how many chances do you give them? How many times do you use Narcan? Right. That's that's the debate. You know, you can make an amendment that everybody has to carry it, but right. what are the statutes of limitations? How many times do you still save? An Somebody addict? who doesn't want to be saved. But, but 
the thing is, is heroin is such a nasty addiction that it has a, a severe stigma around it. You know, like, well, if somebody's stupid enough to do it, then they deserve to die. Well, that goes back to me complaining about addictions overall. There's all kinds of fucking addictions out there, but some are more acceptable than others. Like, overeating, that's acceptable. She's just curvy. No, that's morbid obesity. I, that pisses me off when you see somebody who <laughs> yeah. is, is, I'm not talking about these beautiful curvy women. I'm talking about women who need, you know, they, they eat three loaves of bread, two dozen eggs for breakfast. It, that's not healthy. That's an addiction. That's, you're addicted to eating food. You're addicted to hoarding. And I'm not talking, <laughs> right, in your body. You know, you want to put all that, and that doesn't make any sense. I, hello. <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, the, the, that's overdoing it, overdoing it on anything. I'm addicted to caffeine. I drank the fuck out of some coffee. You know what I mean? And crash I out like, it. I'm dying, I'm dying. But I, give me another cup. You know, I'm not shaking enough. So, you know, I do. I love my caffeine. I don't give a shit. I, I'm, I'm an addict. And, you know, I am. But we're all. But that's an acceptable, but that's an acceptable addiction. And I think that's right. the biggest, that um, a lot of the people don't see that. They uh, they see heroin as a choice, but they don't see coffee as a choice. They don't right. see Sudafed as a choice. They don't see Claritin D. They don't see nasal sprays. These little things I'm mentioning are that people need. I need. I, need, I have to take have Benadryl. Uh, yeah, you know, and and those things are are. Should I need a Benadryl? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're a slow addiction, and people don't see that. Well, I mean, it's okay. Like it's okay. They're putting a nose sprayer up their nose like every like two hours. Don't you think that's right? It's there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with the what like media addiction yeah. oh, people man. who are addicted to internet porn um gambling drinking smoking i mean well then how about we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna come across the, the bridge that's about to happen which is well if we can save uh the heroin addicts why can't we put more of a uh, why can't we save everybody if you want us to save the heroin addicts then we should save the social media addicts we should save the obesity right. we should save and that is the other well if we're gonna save one then we save them all but it's but Again. then you have people who are like, why don't we just legalize everything and not and not have any kind of rules or and just let people do whatever the fuck they want, you know? Like, if they want to do heroin, let them fucking do heroin. And it's very... What is that? That's a car starting up next door. Oh, that's what that is. We can edit that out <laughs> in the background. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my neighbors are. They've only got like 19 cars over there. So you know what? Uh, it adds a CD element to our podcast. <laughs> it We're does. Live from a garage, mother trucker. You're lucky. <laughs> You're welcome. We're a garage. We're literally a it's garage also podcast. Like 87 degrees in my garage, and we don't have any fans you going. Know, so no. and <laughs> you're welcome, so that you don't have to listen to us over a fan. First of all, you are fucking. Welcome, America. Okay. Exactly. I, Addiction to water now. Uh, I shouldn't say America because I mean I'm hoping there's some people over in Finland who are like, "What is this? Is this? Are these real Americans? Is this what they do?" I mean, <laughs> I'm out here fishing. I think it's actually Iceland. They love to fish. Yeah. <laughs> I don't they know. All, they love to fish. Well, That's they, all they got. <laughs> they, they, they know how to live off the land, unlike ourselves. Those and I, again, they're with the addiction of a fast food, don't they crazy have, food. Like, don't they have like the highest happy no, that's Denmark. Like the hat. Oh, they're so but, happy. But they're like one of the happiest places to live. Like they have a yeah. high. They're just like whatever. Yeah. Huh? We're all happy over here. Now let's get back to the. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Off on my happiness rant. <laughs> Don't be happy. Uh, be sad. You know what? We're um, very serious right now. The state of mental health in America right now. First of all, I am angry, angry, angry. I tell you, at the fact that mental health budgets have been slashed, slashed over the last 30, 40 years. You, know, we used to have state-run hospitals and all kinds of programs. You know, my aunt Treva. But have you seen the pictures of the psych wards from the 70s? You know what? I mean, some of them got zapped and 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 did you did you know like female hysteria, they just had those little dildo machines where they would just fuck women with dildos. Like she just needs a good fucking, you know, but with a machine. I don't know, I'm not going to fuck your wife, the doctor. He just had like a saddle with a ding-dong and he would just <laughs> get these women on there. I mean, but they were calm afterwards. I mean, who wouldn't be after a good orgasm? I mean, you know, you know it was great times. And I, I think I'm a proponent of rubbing one off as often as you can, <laughs> girls. I'm saying, you know, they tell guys like, you know, jerk off before a date. Rub one off before a date. That way you're really looking at that dude like <laughs> with logic, not like, I wonder if he can fill this <laughs> void between my legs right or you know, like, well, he makes strong babies. You know, you take away that fair. You're not sniffing them around. Like, mm, can I procreate with this guy? 
does this guy have a brain? <laughs> Most often than not, uh, not always. But anyways, anyways, back, back to mental health and the addictions, and this all started somewhere. So, you know what? Well, with mental health here in Finley, we were talking about right before we started recording the fact that there are no, uh, there are really no options for ninety percent of the people that live and work here. You know, there's there's high price psychiatry and um, mental health programs that people can't afford. They don't have the insurance or whatever. So, you know, and some employers, if they find out you got some mental health issues, they'll fire you. I mean, you know, if they're covered under your insurance, they know. Yep, exactly. And I think that that is a lot of the problems that it comes down to with people who are, they're shame. Shame. Uh, I don't tell my employers about anything. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Like according to all of my resumes, I am in interviews or applications I have filled out. I am completely 100% normal average white female in the United States of America, and I have no problems. You know because what? they actually, depending on what kind of people they hire, now I get out, now I might be hired because I do have problems. There might be like, look, we're going to get a grant if we hire an epileptic. Let's hire this girl. So right. there might be some benefits to it, but the, uh, overall, people are going to question you. Down the road, how's that going to affect you at your next employer? Just because yeah. your one employer wants to get the tax benefit, <laughs> the other one might not like the insurance cost that it might come that you might come you know, your health risk. Exactly, and that's one of those things where I don't, I don't put my health on record either. I'm healthier than a horse. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what y'all talk about. I ain't never I been am, poked, I am, nothing. <laughs> I am, I'm, I'm a non-smoking, non-drinking mile percent. I'm, you know? A mile a day in my brain, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> I, I, I like my to anxiety others. makes me run and burn calories like you don't even see. You know? uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think it is a lot of shame. Is is people have been shamed into in if you're uh, bipolar is a big one and a very common one. And people are you know they used to call it manic depressive. A lot of people don't know that these days of you know what they call it is bipolar. But back in the day. When we were little, people, I would hear it. People would say, well, she's manic depressive. That's the same thing as being bipolar. But there's also, like, bipolar. There's bipolar 2. There is bipolar manic depression. I mean, there is... There is a list, and, and, and everybody's allowed to belong. And whatever list y'all want to belong, you know, whatever, but that's fine. Stop self-diagnosing yourself, though. It, go find... <laughs> go get an updated... Like, when I was... The last time I was diagnosed was when I was 16 years old. That's also why I don't go and tell anybody anything because my last, I'm 16 years old. I just started having seizures a year prior. I'm on Paxil, Xanaxes, Depakote, Dilantin. I'm a, I'm a guinea pig because these seizures started so late in my life. There's no reason for them. They don't understand them. Blah, 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 blah. So, you know, I'm a guinea pig. And so, you know, well, they're saying I'm having all these side effects because this is who I am. Well, and is this who I am or my or I am this person because of that? And so over the years, I've done my own, like, I don't know, self-diagnosing. Like, I know the difference between a panic and anxiety attack. I know those right. kind of things. But at the same time, like, I don't want to go to a doctor. Uh, I should, but I don't uh, because... <laughs> I don't want that shit on fire. <laughs> I don't I, need a paper trail. I don't. I don't want a paper trail, and not only that, but and everything's digital, so it's actually on the internet. I, I don't. I hate trying to explain to doctors that I my foil hats falling <laughs> off, <laughs> and that I don't want the medication because right. they're instant. Like when I go see my neurologist, they are now they love me because I sit there and they're like, Amanda, okay, so what kind of medications do you want? None. What's going on with you? Nothing. I'm here for my regular checkup. Blah 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 blah. And they're like, wait, what? Look, I don't want to, you know, now I'm I'm usually pretty, I'm going to say like, I'm like 85% honest with my neurologist. There might be like a few things I won't tell them about because, you know, they might see it. Uh, oh, no, Miles. I saw that <laughs> on a Grey's Anatomy episode. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> well, they see things like, uh, like for me, like the, the heat. I'm cool with the heat. I'm cool with sweating. I'm not cool with being in the sunlight and sweating. I've, if my feet are not in constant water, I am going to just, I will have really weird reactions to it. And I can, I consider that heat stroke. Yep. They consider it as my, uh, as mild seizures and those mild seizures get me to not have a license anymore. Right. So I'm going to be a 34 year old mother of two trying to get to two different jobs without a car. Right. Or I'm not just not going to tell you, but that heat stroke that I had, right. and this is, it's and, fine. It's fine. fine. <laughs> and this is, again, it's a, it's a problem where even some people are afraid of the repercussions of their own doctors. 
and or even going to them or you go to them and you tell them what's wrong and they want you A, B, and C. I can't tell you how many times they've thrown pills at me. I've got a whole drawer full of things that yeah, I don't exactly. take. I don't want your shit. I don't want your candy. I haven't been on medication <laughs> in four years or so. Just I'm just yep. you know, it started off with one medication and then they prescribed me another one to combat the effects from the first one. And now I ended up on five medications and there's just no reason to be on five medications and I was so sick all the time and I felt like shit and mm-hmm. I feel you know it takes me longer to get around in the morning and whatever you know to do it to take care of myself in my own homeopathic type situation but I feel a lot fucking better well exactly and I think that's one of those things where I've also noticed you know because I you know, we, I have loved ones and stuff that are on drugs that, you know, I see them, they see, I see them trying to be without them and how that changes them after so long. And some people legitimately, it, does, it ch- chemically changes the way your and brain they really, responds. Yep. And, and they really lot. need it. And that, and I'm all about it. I, for me, I, I'm not going to judge anybody who wants to be on the medication because it truly does help them live a more quote unquote normal life where their they're quality eight. of life goes up but yep. did you know and i i know this this was something that i read in a scientific journal about vicodin and it's, i don't know if percocet and, and the other narcotics are the same way but vicodin has a way of messing with the your way your brain works and it'll actually send pain signals to your body saying i need another i need more because it realizes that you take it for pain it's like it's a smart addiction and it actually makes you feel worse. It makes you feel like you're in more pain than you actually are to get you to take it because some people don't get addicted to it mentally and that's how they, they get clean off their pills and then they don't turn to heroin. That's why you have some people who can't go with it. You know, that, that, that's some people have the addictive personality, some people don't. Mm-hmm. You know, but when your body's addicted to it, but once their body's off of it, they realize they're not in as much pain as they were. And I'll tell you what, I am in a lot less pain than I was when I was on painkillers. That's fucking weird. That's really <laughs> fucking weird, not right. Yep, no, and it's not, and I think that a lot of people... You know, um, that's how they're like, I need it. You don't understand. I'm in so much fucking pain. Yeah. And they have their own aspect of seeing what makes them right or wrong. And I'm not against oils. I'm not against crystals. I'm not against your salt lamps, your whatever it is <laughs> that you guys need. Like back up from my microphone. Cause I'm laughing. <laughs> like, and I'm not, and I'm not laughing at that. Like, I don't want to get people no, to get no, me no, wrong, no. but cause I, mean, I, there's people that swear by that. Like I have a, and you don't know. I mean, uh, yeah. the, the human but body is a mystery. Re- yep. And everybody reacts differently. And that's why I'm like, look, I've tried a lot of these things and they've just never, they work now that are, it's a, it's a mental state of mind. And I get that. And I'm mentally kind of like this ain't, I'm I'm already too far in my head that this is not going to fix me that I don't allow it to fix me if it could. I'm one of those people who say, okay, I'm going through this, so here are my steps to take that I know how to work with it. And so, again, though, it's how people get their own life together. Hey, does it make you feel good to rub some peppermint oil on the bottom of your feet, on the back of your ears? You know, sit in like a seat. Like if that works for you and that keeps you off of drugs and that keeps you... From to pop on a pill three times a day. Then I'm all about it. And if some people are like, I need to pop a pill three times a day, but this is only one pill and I'm not taking it. You do what makes you better. But I want to make sure that people are asking the right questions when they go to the doctors. What are the side effects? But I didn't know for seven years that I was going, I had a 75%, no, it was five years. It was five years I was taking it. So after seven years, you have a 75% chance of liver cancer. Oh, that's nice. They, now I was getting my blood taken. Okay. So I was getting my blood taken every three months and I just, they were checking it for, for uh, my white. Liver failure. Uh, well, they were checking it for my white blood cell count mm-hmm. is what I was told. For five years, I'm taking my medication. Now, it wasn't the greatest. I would, you know, miss some, you know, doses here and there, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, one night, I'm sitting in my apartment. I'm stoned. And uh, I, I, I'm like, I'm, what is this? You know, and I'm like, there's my, my bottle. My pills came in, and they were delivered to me. And so I'm like, I'm going to read all this stuff. And I realized that this one pill had 10 pages. But the beyond, like, you know, don't get pregnant, because after, like, four weeks, yes. if, which you don't even know, yes. your, your child's going to be damaged anyways. Right. Then it goes into, you have a 75% chance of liver cancer after seven years. I'm in year five. Cool. Nobody thought to tell me. Like, I get that I started this medication when I was younger, but right. you never thought once in my adult life to, to tell me. me what could happen if I take this medication. Exactly. Like, if I knew you are taking my blood three times, like, you know, every three months to check for liver cancer, I might have right. really thought the process a long time ago. Right. And if I did, then I wouldn't have been prescribed 
five or six other backup pills because of my reactions to it. So exactly. that was like my end all. That was my end all be all get off everything. Well, that's just like you hear medication commercials now and that shit is frightening. Uh-huh. Like, oh my gosh. And it, it's always worse. Like, especially the ones that they do for the irritable bowel syndrome. Like, <laughs> You may have explosive diarrhea. Like, I thought this is what we were combating, not, not <laughs> you know, the like anal leakage. If uh, I ever have anal you're leakage... You're going to be bleeding out of your nose, your ears, and your eyeballs. If this happens, please go to the hospital. <laughs> every day for the rest. You may lose hair and gain 35 pounds. And Yay! This, yay! <laughs> well, and that's just it. And people don't understand all those concepts. You know, it's like uh, when I was very first put into a... Uh, in, in on uh, I think it was dilantin, and that was really bad for females to take because it has a very high testosterone. So oh nice yep. Yeah, so I'm taking this my very first pill. I was so, when my uh, seizures very first started, <clears throat> and that medication. Now I'm talking. I was a big swim bug when I was younger. I love swimming. I love vegetables. I very rarely ate. I was out in the sun. I went from 110 pounds to 155 over a summer break. Right. How At high that school. Work? So imagine going back into high school, you know, one summer later, and you are, you know, 35, 45 pounds heavier than where you were at. Everybody, of course, automatically assumes, A, that you're pregnant, so you get that whole thing. Plus, I love keeping my hair short, so that was always a win-win for me. And, uh, but not only that, but I had no idea. I thought this was, I mean, I was trying everything. I was swimming, I was doing this, I was doing that, I was trying everything. Didn't and I, matter. Didn't matter. I was growing mustache hair. I mean, there was this whole thing, and I'm like... And then finally, I saw a different doctor. The doctor was like, why are you on this? This is so terrible for females to take. Well, I'm 15, 15, 16 years old. What do I, you know, my mom, a doctor tells me, my mother, this is a pill that's going to stop her from having seizures, even though it didn't. I'm going to take it because I want to be able to not have seizures. That would be awesome. But I, if I knew that, I mean, that struggle of me coming down to that weight took years because I was fluctuating because of medications and then my depression and then my self-worth, like went down the tubes because I felt bad about who I was. So then the, the pills made it worse. Yeah. Because at the same time too, you guys will be like, Hey, if I pop like three Zannies, one Paxil, this med and like smoke, just like three hits off of a joint. I'm going to be like super happy. Right. For, and I'm going to feel really that's good. Perfect to- <laughs> cocktail. <laughs> perfect cocktail. And that's going to make me feel like it's cool that I don't have a whole lot of friends who like me for who I am and that guys don't really want to date me. They just want to have sex with me. Like, that, it diminishes, like, self-worth to some degree, and that is what worries me the most about how this uh, heroin or the opiate epidemic has worked itself in, is because it's made people feel like if they're not on it, then they're not worthy of living in right. society. And that goes, you know... that pharmaceutical companies have just basically taken over and you know they pushed the oxy and uh, uh, opana is what the fda is now recommending that they take off the market because of its high use rate but tramadol which is a a lower end uh it's usually something they'll give you in the emergency room or whatever because it's a non-narcotic it's a synthetic too and i can remember being prescribed that back in the early 2000s or mid 2000s and them telling my doctor saying, I'm going to prescribe this for you because it's non addictive, but it'll take care of your pain. And then here we are 10 years later, like, no, that's highly addictive, you know, and like, that's really awful, people. Come on. So now it's coming out 10 years later after all these drugs have come out that they cause severe addiction issues. And then they tried to put a clamp down on all of these pills. Like, you know, 10 years ago, you could go down to Southern Ohio and there were pill mills that you could go. And you could just walk in, see a doctor. He'd prescribe you 90 per set tens and walk out. I mean, it wasn't even a real doctor. They called them pill mills. Um, Ohio led the death, wasn't it the death? Oh, they led the nation in overdose deaths in 2015. That's ridiculous. I mean, that's how bad it is here in Ohio. And I know personally just, you know, every other day it's a friend of mine or, or, a, or somebody I know or somebody's family member who died of an overdose or almost died or is in jail or, you know, 
Who doesn't love looking at the Active Inmates website? <laughs> oh, the Active them? Inmates are so great. That's my favorite gossip site. If I can't figure out who's like on there, what like the best story is, uh, Finley Assholes on Twitter. Shout out to you guys because they always find like the best I know, story. He's or so the, funny. <laughs> they're so I don't, funny. I, 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 I don't I know really, who you are, but we like you. I enjoy your posts. Yeah, very much so. I'm I, what I, I'm sitting here. I'm trying to find is I really wish I could find it, but I cannot in my Google search. But I know that um, I was watching this. I believe leave on netflix question mark hulu question mark but it was one of those streaming services streaming service, but it was a documentary about how you know they opened up um a warehouse in florida or this guy had this really small okay first it started off as a house that turned into a warehouse but this guy mm-hmm. realized that oh are you here for the opiate yeah i guess you're here for the opiate plants Is that yeah. what <laughs> this dude Went from, like, a small town like Finley, but it is in Florida, but went from this very small, like, little out of the shop. He found a, uh, he found one doctor that would, he paid him enough money that this doctor would pretty much just write prescriptions and get paid to write prescriptions. Yeah. And so what happened was that, you know, suddenly, you know, it turns into, like, five or ten friends. They walk into your house, doctor writes a prescription, they go, they get their fill, life is good. Mm-hmm. All cash in hand. Yeah. da 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 No insurance necessary. Boom. Blows up this whole. I mean, this documentary is shocking, but it's not at the same time. But and suddenly, it wasn't just one doctor. One doctor gave another doctor the idea, and suddenly, this and guy. Suddenly, yeah, I. You know, I. I. I know what you're talking about because I remember reading year, a couple years ago because I've been following the news on opiates and and For a long and, time. and the pill mills being shut down and and just following its its progression in the last 10 years and how and i and i kind of know what you're talking about that's basically how it started to blow up was actually started in florida and right. then they and they moved so what people would do is that they would come down from kentucky yep, yep. all the way yes, down to florida they would. yes they because would. they could get you know 90 to 120 I pills that. people yep. like saying like well i got a friend that's coming back you know from florida with you know whatever you know? whatever they wanted and these doctors i mean and and you would the uh, the FBI or CIA, whoever, you know, bugged the place and they would watch this video camera of, I mean, hundreds of patients coming in. You're talking about five minute visits, you know, walking in, getting their, I'm in pain. Here's your prescription. What do you need? Right. You know, and they, and they're walking out and now these doctors are all legal, but these doctors were paid, you know, under By the those table. pharmaceutical reps. Yep. I mean, they pushed it as a safe and effective drug that would treat pain. So at the time they were doing... Mm-hmm. What was medically suggested and, and, and helping so many people. But as we can see, then they found out, you know, they realized, like, this, people are just selling these back yeah. and forth. Like, this is people just getting high. Yep. And so they cut that off. And so what did people do? They turned to fucking heroin. Mm-hmm. You know, like, people who couldn't, some people got clean. Like, um, I was on painkillers for five or six years steady. And when I had, when I went off of them, I just went off of them. You know, I didn't try and buy some from a friend, you know, like I just could not justify paying the prices that they, first of all, want for those medications on the street. And two, it's just a pain in the ass because one pill isn't going to do anything for me, but for the next four to six hours, you know what I mean? That's just to me. I just moved on. I just, you know, like, well, I'll just do my own thing instead. And it took six months to a year. I mean, it takes you a long time. Like, you were talking about people that you know that are on that medication. I was a much different person during the time that I was on painkillers. I was a lot angrier. I felt like my um, emotions were depressed. You know what I mean? Like, it was very hard for me to feel things. You know, like, I almost felt like I had to push through a cloud in order to feel anything. I mean, it doesn't just numb the pain. It numbs you as a person. And then it takes a very long time. And, and, and you know, I, we can look up some articles or whatever to see what the long term... Do we even honestly know? Because it's such a newer epidemic. I mean, I know Percocet and, and some of these painkillers have been around for a long time. But do we know what the lifetime effects of the change that it had on the brain... What does that do to the brain over time? Like, will I ever be right again? You know? Well, and exactly. And, you know, when you're going into whether or not they're ever going to be right again, um, you know... Shout out to a few of the people who went on to our, our Facebook page, which you can always like, share, follow, comment. Thanks. Right. Uh, <laughs> please. Please. Um, we want to, you know, a lot of you guys had a, some really, you know, insight about what was going on into your small towns. You know, we were from a small town and you go on to the more southern part of Ohio and, you know, we're starting to really read about, you know, where you guys think it could happen. Okay, well, we can start here. But they, 
It happens all around us. It happens all around us. And and every town is so overwhelmed. I mean, coroners, I mean, how many stories we have to read about coroners, you know, putting bodies in a... The uh, rent and storage lockers. Yeah. They they can't, I mean, there's such a, there's so many people dying. Um, I actually worked at a factory where I live. And last summer, somebody overdosed. I worked in the office, but somebody actually overdosed in the bathroom in the shop. Um, I mean, and they were from, they were actually a Finley couple, somebody that drove over and worked there. Um, but I mean, that, that, that was really like, I mean, in, in that place, they have a very lax, um, drug policy. Like people smoke weed openly in the outdoor smoke shack. I mean, that's just one of those things. And again, like. I'm all about, if you want to smoke a joint, I, I really don't have a problem with marijuana. I have a problem when you're doing other things, and that is... Right, a, people shooting up in the parking lot. I mean, we have people passing out in their cars on their yep. break and having to go knock on the window and wake them well, up. Well, I like, recently uh, found you're out... you fired, you know? And I recently found out that we can't go to uh, the restroom. If you go to a lot of, like, these... Uh, they've locked them out. You know how many people They've locked out a lot of public. You know how many people have overdosed in that Circle K restroom down on Crystal Avenue? I mean, just me hearing it through the grapevine word of mouth, not reading, or... Um, I would say I know of at least 20 people I've heard that have OD'd, or heard a story of somebody who was at Circle K, and there was an a ambulance there because somebody OD'd in their bathroom. And so, I don't know if they let people use it anymore, but... Um, a lot of that has changed, and, and, and you know, I'm not... You, you Okay, here's my thing... <sighs> I'm mad because it's stopping my 10-year-old from going into a place mm-hmm. of and using their public restrooms. Right, because you don't know what he's going to find in there. Meals, yeah. I mean... You yeah. don't know. And, and not only that, but because they're shutting down these restrooms and a lot of these, like, small, you know, general stores or wherever else, because people are shooting up so often in there because it's not one of the big Walmarts. You know, they're not really going in right, all the way right. into Walmart, you know. Right. They're going to these smaller, uh, cheaper places to do it for whatever reason. More privacy. More privacy. And so, unfortunately, now, because of that, though, they're, you know, you're in there and your child has to go to the restroom, but now they can't. Or people like you myself have who sleep have... sleep at first. Yeah. And, or people like myself who, you know, I've had two kids. Guess what? If I have actually drank my 64 ounces of water today, you all better get me to a restroom, but they don't care because... They don't know that even if I am with my kids, am I that kind of person? They go in there and shoot up. And I don't blame them because nobody wants that. For one, that's an insurance liability on, on the right. companies. And by the same time, I don't want to put such a stigma. I don't want that to sound like a, a, a stigma towards those who are battling the addiction that you've ruined my ability to go to the restroom. But however... They don't, and I, and I get that, the addicts don't see the bigger picture. They, they don't, don't see, see the, the destruction light. that they do because they're so centered on their addiction. And, and, and a lot of them will do what they got to do. They don't think about it. It's just, when you're in a desperate situation, you do desperate things, and you don't think about other people. You're you're thinking about yourself, and that's what an addict does, is they're thinking about that next high. I mean, I've seen videos of people who, you know... Um, I don't know if you saw it, but there was uh, two people who shot up, and then they went to McDonald's, and the guy OD'd while they were sitting in the booth, and she gave him a shot of Narcan and revived him, and it was all on camera. Like, he slumped over, she shot him with some Narcan. I mean, I saw a video, somebody had posted that was from Sandusky, Ohio, of, of two guys that had passed out in a parking lot. I don't know if you saw that or not. No. And they just, uh, one of them was laying on the ground outside of the car. The other one was in the car, and they were both passed out. And one guy was, like, this close to dying. Like, he was doing the death rattle. Um, it was really hard to watch. But it was, you know, and it was two women, like, pulling into work. And one just happened to be a nurse. And she ended up saving his life. I mean, she's taking his pulse. And, get, I mean, just, it's that's whole what thing. I mean is, like, is how it affects our community. Like, one of the comments, uh, somebody that commented on our Facebook page, Christine, she was talking about how it happened in her parking lot where she works. It was just, you know, she bartends at a restaurant, I think, still. I'm not real sure. Um, And, you know, that was here in in Dayton, Ohio, you know, or outside of it, or suburb, you know, down there. I mean, it's just a normal day at work, and it's happening in the parking lot. And it happens everywhere. How many posts have you seen of people complaining on the online garage sale sites finding needles in their yard? Well, exactly. And I read a a story about a week ago. Um, I follow, it's like, I think it's like 4019 News or whatever. Love it. It has to do with the Lima area. And uh, this poor lady... She uh, goes out for her morning newspaper, and there is, um, like, she was just catching it where a guy shoved somebody else outside of his car and took off, and this dude was overdosing in her driveway, and she's just... She just wants to get her newspaper. Right. Like, <laughs> That's all just, she wants. We, like, got, we got people just <laughs> dying on the street. I just want my newspaper, you know? You know, and, and this guy literally just gets shoved out of a car, thrown in her driveway, 
and just left there to die. And if she had not gone out that morning at her regular time... That guy would have died. Or would have died. Die. I, I, I believe somebody came in and saved him, and she didn't know the whole thing. But right. she was like, you know, for... You know, for one, she was like, you know, fuck you to the dude who just leaves somebody right. here in my yard with my kids to in die. the hot tub. To die. <laughs> like, you know, that's I, some Pulp Fiction shit. <laughs> it is. You know it, what is. I'm it really is. And that's one of those things where we're like, that's how one of those movies starts. Oh, it really is. And, uh, <laughs> snatch. I got uh, an idea of a movie script now, girl. It starts with a heroin addict rolling into your yard on a Wednesday morning. <laughs> and small towns of Barbara in the USA. Right. You know, and, and, and uh, what do you do? How do you, you know, and, and not only that, but what can we get to our legislators? So we can talk about how we're all trying. So we're trying to get people into all of our local rehab places. We're trying to get them into state hospitals. What, you know, but we don't we, have state hospitals or anything anymore. I That's know. The thing. And you know what? Um, I I, ha I don't come to Finley that often when what I do. I've been critical of Finley and the fact that they've ignored a lot of the um, addictions and whatever. But I have to say that I did notice a billboard the other day talking about, um, I've seen billboards, you know, if you feel addicted or whatever, like, you know, let's come together, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they also have a drug court here now, which yeah. I think is really fucking neat. That's it's something smart. that's really... But, what, a year or two ago, they wanted to put a halfway house in, and what happened here in Finley? <laughs> we don't have no drug addicts. I mean, so, the entire neighborhood, to so that they wouldn't have to live next door to a halfway house. It was so like a pipeline situation in North Dakota, but like in a really small town for just somebody to get some freaking drug rehab help. I mean, right. that was literally they somebody else. They all banded else. together <laughs> and bought, a ha bought the house that they wanted to buy to make into a halfway house, so that they so they wouldn't have to live next to a halfway house. Yeah. So, I don't think they ever found another place or whatever. Like it never, the idea never took off because that was all they could afford that house or whatever. And so the neighborhood was like, well, we don't want a halfway house in our neighborhood. It's too close to the kids. Okay, here's the thing too close to schools and kids. Listen, people in halfway houses aren't fucking perverts or child predators or people trying to get their lives together. A halfway house for a rehab is an addiction situation. So why are you worried about somebody who's trying to get their life together around your kid? And they're not, not, they're not a, they're not a child predator. I can understand if they were like, this is a halfway house for sex offenders. We're going to put it across the street from a school. We're going to test their, <laughs> test their resolve. You know, hopefully nobody's kid comes up missing. You can have another. I mean, you know, we're a populist country. We love popping out babies. Pro, pro life, you know. And Somebody how else, else do you make you people that? feel no. so, like, out of place? You're making them feel so unwelcomed. And right. How else? All right, well, I'll just go OD under the bridge. <laughs> you know? Fuck but, <laughs> I mean, that, or I'm not trying to laugh, but I mean, no. seriously, like, this is a problem. Like, how if somebody sees these normal everyday lives and they actually are inspired by it? Like, I don't want... To sit here and be a dumbass because I have, like, not for a bunch of kids be, like, weirdly watching this person, but in their mental state of mind, maybe that will help them. Like, I'm in a normal neighborhood. I'm living amongst normal families. I right. don't want, like, this is what normalcy feels like. You know what? I lived, or I didn't live, I stayed for about three months next to a uh, halfway house or, or a reha rehab center. And honestly, I never saw the people. When I did, they were sitting on the porch. They were always quiet. I mean, they were just trying to... You, they're busy. They're between. They have to work, and then they have a, a butt ton of counseling and 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 other group activities. I mean, they're not really free yet. You know, they don't just come and go as they want. They're they're you know, they have certain hours that they're allowed to be out. They have goals that they have to accomplish. Like their whole focus is getting clean and getting back on the path of sobriety. So nobody, they don't even have time to come over and socialize with you. They're just not even allowed, honestly. Um, it's just like jail, but you have a little bit more normalcy because they, it's a way to integrate them back into society. Nor, you know what I mean? So once they move and they move into their own place, there's not much change up in their life. And they're ready to, okay, here I go. I'm off on my new path. But then, um, you know, I've been seeing ad, you, complaints that you know, nobody wants to work in the manufacturing plants or whatever. Um well, there's been such an opiate heroin epidemic that there are a lot of people out there that have possession of drug, possession of paraphernalia. You know what I mean? And if it's been a certain amount of time long since then, I think we need to relax those rules for people because you're really limiting your workforce pool by um, being that much of a stickler about those things. Like, we're going to have to give these people a chance because it's big, especially in Ohio for a manufacturing state. You're going to have to loosen those regular, you know what I mean? Do your random drug test. But if somebody's been clean for two years 
or you know what I mean, or, or demonstrated that, then we need to turn a blind eye to that instead of saying, "Sorry, you have a possession charge from two, three years ago, and we're not gonna, we can't hire you." Okay, so who are you gonna hire? Because you're complaining that you don't have anybody to hire. Exactly, and I think that is a huge stigma that is even harder is about. I know there's been a few posts right. here and there about here are the places that are going to hire you if you have a prior felony. Right. And so that, kudos to those companies, by the way, who right. is not about turning a blind eye. It's about giving people a second chance. And I think at the end of the day that you really have to understand that people want a job because they are trying to live a normal life. And you can't get them out of the situation they're in by leaving them in the situation they're in. McDonald's and Subway do background checks. Um, I had a friend who applied at the McDonald's in um, Upper Sandusky, and he was turned down because he had a paraphernalia charge from three a marijuana paraphernalia charge, like a pipe or something, from three years ago. Um, so he couldn't even get a job at McDonald's. I mean... So what are we supposed to do with these? You know, I mean, he wasn't an addict or, or whatever else. And it wasn't quite as serious as heroin. But, I mean, just for a minor paraphernalia charge, you can't even get a job at McDonald's. And if you look now, because of the heroin epidemic and, and so many people committing crimes, and, and it's not just trafficking and drugs and, and drug abuse instruments and um, aggravate, you know, all dr actual drug convictions, you have petty theft, people who steal. Like, I mean, how often do you see that in a local jail? I mean, there's so many people in there for petty theft, and it's because they're stealing to fuel their drug habits. You know what I mean? That people don't want to hire thieves. Well, I was a thief when I was an addict. I'm not a person that steals. You know, but when I was under the influence, yes, you know, I did things that I shouldn't have done. And, you know, that's another thing that limits people is it's, it's, it's wide-reaching. If you become addicted to a drug and you make a mistake, there's just no room for error in America, and that's ridiculous because life... It's literally day by day you learn. And it's not fair that, you know, something that happened 20 years ago follows you and through your life. If you're a great person that works hard, you deserve to be taken as you are as a person and not who you are on paper. I absolutely 100% agree to that. And I think that this is where the interview process comes in between your human resources department and the actual person or the boss or whoever if you don't take time to actually get to know somebody, then and if you think that you're not hiring the right person just because of what they look like on paper and you don't get to the bottom of who they are, then you kind of suck as an employer. And anybody can look like anything on paper. Yep. You know what I mean? And, and, and any story, if you look at a piece of paper of somebody's life, you can infer any kind of story from what you read. You know, you can take it for anything that you want. And But if you meet the person... You understand who they are as a person. You, you Sometimes those things are overlooked because that person is just so amazing at what they do. I don't care what you did 20 years ago. You're a different person now. And we don't have enough of that anymore. No, you know? and, I, and I think that we, we really don't. And I think that we don't have enough of those, you know, understanding that some people just come from a certain circumstance. And, you know, it takes them through until their 20s to realize that that's not the way to go. Yep. And by then, you're at 30s or 40s. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you. You never know when it's going to be somebody's light at the end of the tunnel. And I don't understand why companies themselves don't want to be a sponsor of changing people's lives. That's not only good PR. Right. That's just good being a human being. Right. You know, that's this is about you could use this on such a many levels. Oh, look at us. We took this person underneath this thing. Here's this great post about it. We could put it on social media. Who knows the news is going to catch up on this. But you this know, is great PR. Just help people become better human beings by being a good person yourself to begin with. I think I think what a lot of it has to do with um, insurance regulations and things like that that they are holding these companies back. Like, no, we don't. If you hire people who um, have drug trafficking charges or whatever, your insurance rate goes up, or or you know, it costs them more money, and some and some it has to because employers just want people to work for them, and there's just certain reasons why, like they get liability. A tax, you know what I mean? Liability, exactly. Uh, you, that they'll hire, like you know, when you fill out a job application, they'll ask you if you've ever gotten any Medicaid benefits in the last 16 months. Have you ever been on welfare, whatever? Because they get a tax credit. You know why that Hispanic button? Are you Hispanic? They get a tax credit for hiring poor Mexicans. And you know, my brother, like I'm a tall, busty redhead, but my brother straight up looks like an Indian or a Mexican. I mean, he yeah. And I told him when he was out job hopping, you know, job shopping, not hopping. I mean, he both, whatever. 
But, you know, I was like, you need to check that Hispanic box, brother. I'm not joking. You know what I mean? Like, take advantage. Fucking people call you a Mexican anyway, so why not take advantage of it? Get those tax credits. Exactly. <laughs> you well, know, get that, get that funding to go to college, buddy. Fuck it. You know? <laughs> they want to play. The government plays us all the time. Play them back. Exactly. And I think it's, you know, and again... You, there is so many problems that we can only solve amongst talking to each other and talking to ourselves. And I know that there are great things that are being done. I know today at um, the local park they had, you know, uh, a sobriety kind of uh, barbecue thing. Did from they? What I, yeah, he did. You know, a lot of these, uh, I, I was reading, one of my friends was there and, you know, he was he's clean, he's sober, he's changing his life. Like, you know, look at me, I'm lit. And it's literally like him like drawing with chalk. I mean, right. but that's so awesome because they're finding this way of, of grouping together. And I appreciate everybody who is, you know, you guys are banding together as, as sober friends. You guys are being your guys's, you know, advisors. I need that though. Like I've I mean, actually all joined a couple addiction groups just to kind of get a feel for the community. And, you know, You'll see a lot of people that I know as acquaintances or whatever in there. You know, like day three, I felt really, really, it was really a rough day for me today. Or some people fall back. You know, it's just like uh, AA. A, a. Yeah. Um, they, they have a really great support system, and I think that that's really neat. But we don't have a citywide Narcotics Anonymous or support system, and I, I don't. And if know, we do, I've never, I've never heard of it. At least I know that there's local meetings. I think I've seen signs. I know in um, Upper Sandusky that there's a couple signs I've seen for like in a church basement. Yeah, you know. Um, but I think that we also need to meet somewhere that's. Now, this is nothing against anybody who believes in God by any means. I'm not, and I get that we for need a safe place for people who don't have to worry about religion. That's the thing about AA. Is it's a re- it's also a very religious experience. You know what I yeah. mean. You work your twelve steps, and those twelve steps. NA has twelve steps too, or thir- fourteen. I mean, it's been a while since I looked at their program, so I'm not real sure. But NA is a little bit different. They even have their own program or whatever, but it's not like that. But AA is tied to the Bible, and I think because it was started by a church group, perhaps I I read about it a long time ago. I have to apologize that I don't. Remember. No, and, and exactly. And I'm not against, I, I'm really not against, I, I appreciate all the churches reaching out and helping. I know that there's a lot of these churches out here that are offering up their space and their time. And I thank I you. I think that's awesome. That's a beautiful do, and that's awesome. Not a local, they do rent out <laughs> their space as much as, you know. Or they're helping other people or they're like, come to our services. There's no judgment zones here. And, and some but of some them people really don't do. want to, but they want they the don't help. Want to. Yeah, they want the help, but they don't want the preachy message that comes with it. Exactly. And, so and I, you think that the preachy message is going to help, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes people it just, just makes need. Them feels it makes them feel worse. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, well, well, not only am I trying to battle my addiction, now I'm worried that God's mad at me. Yeah. yeah. It, it not, that's a heavy one, y'all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know Especially saying. for those who were very um, religious before, religious before coming into their addiction, and then they really feel they have failed like God. And of course, they God. know that God forgives them for their sins. And I. But do you really want that weighing down on you as part of your addiction, or maybe that's what spurs people on? I think everybody needs something different. Yeah, and, and I we just need to make sure that we're giving that option out there. That maybe like the more I. It's still a lot of work. I get it. But I feel like it would be really good to have, like, a two-way, hey, by the way, like, for those who need God. Like, or what think- about the library? Don't they have meeting rooms that they could lend out? Right. I mean, and or, maybe they do. I mean, honestly. And maybe they don't. You know, but where I'm, is there else? Not- Why can't we lend out a place that's already closed on a Sunday? Right. You know, can we open up your shop? Da, 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 you know, X amount. Like- a place that people can go for a meeting. That's the nice thing about the bigger cities is literally if you need a meeting, you can go, at, you know, down to 6th Street or there's a meeting at 6 on, on 25th Street. You know, in New York yeah. City, they're on every corner. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, you know, well, maybe we should give up our homes. And I'm like, look, if I, if I knew for sure that I could be helpful to like five people and they needed to borrow my house like three hours, one day a week and like. Right. I could be mentally prepared for that. Like, we right. could talk about it, so that way I could be like, I'll oversee it, fam. You've got to go somewhere else. Right. You know, and I think it's one of those things where at some point, if we really want to stop this, we can't keep waiting on our mayors and our governors and our senators. We have to like, do it as a community. We do. You know? We have to find a way like that to band together, create our own Facebook pages, Twitter lines, whatever it might be, to find a way to help other addicts on a one-on-one basis because they need that one-on-one personal. They may not listen to you and they're going to fall back in, but you have to be also strong enough to know that somebody's going to go ahead and they might 
seem super awesome and they might be like, I'm super sober. Woo! And then three days later they go and they, and they die of an overdose. overdose. Right. You, you, you have to be awesome. prepared for that. And that's something I know that is mentally challenging along the mental health levels of whether or not you are prepared to right. handle that. Because I think a lot of people want to care about heroin addiction. They want to care about the opiate, uh, opiate uh, epidemic, but they don't necessarily have the resources within themselves right. to ha- take it on head on because it is very mentally and emotionally exhaustive. It's n- does not pay well, you know, this is, most of the time it's not, it's, it's all free, you know, yeah, you've got to make it, sure it's a volunteer it, aspect of it. That's what it, it is, is it's, it's a humanity mm-hmm. effort. And I know that there was a heroin epi- epidemic in the eighties. I think it was when I was reading, I was reading about, you know, it was a, I think it was a documentary about um, New York in the 70s and early 80s. Or, or I'm not real sure because I like to watch TV late at night and then fall asleep. So, you know, that, that's how I roll. But um, I love late night TV. I love late night TV. <laughs> I really like adventure time at 1 o'clock in the morning when <laughs> I, I like can't sleep. You can't even concentrate on the story. You're just like, this is so funny. But I love it. I love it so much. But And that's the thing, though, is it takes a little bit from it from everybody and you know the more people that get involved the less work for each person involved you know like and i don't know if i brought it up while we were recording i was talking about it beforehand um i know somebody who lost their husband to an overdose a few years back and she had an idea about starting a non-profit i don't really know that she needs to start a non-profit but a support system where people who have lost their um, loved ones and are ca- carrying on, like, for their pets or for their children or, you know, financial assistance, a support, not a support system, a support network, I guess you would say. Like, you know, you have husbands or wives that are carrying on raising kids that need help. Like, I need somebody to pick my kids up from school every day so I can work. You know, like, widows supporting widows or, or survivors supporting survivors. You know, like, a network like that so that we can try and heal that huge void that's been left by all of these caretakers and parents and loved ones and, and people that were good fucking people. You yeah. know what I mean? And they, and they continue to be really good people. And I think it it's when those... It a village to raise a child and we have all of these children out there who are orphans because of... Everything. Several things, you know. And there's so many aspects of that. And I think that there is a lot of groups that are out there. But, you know, I think here's the problem. I don't know if I really want to tap into this. Oh, well. Here's a problem with nationalism. It's the... The, the problem, right? The, what, 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 how does nationalism tie into addiction? Well, here's the thing. I feel like it's been a lot easier to get programs... And things benefited to those who are our veterans than it is for those who are dying of drugs. Um, and I'm not at all. I mean, my, my brother and my, I have a lot of family members who have all served. I, my, my, my mother is a veteran. Yep, exactly. And I and I'm a, a very good all of you guys veterans. deserve everything that you get. And I'm really, I mean, your wives, your children, all those benefits and all those VA home loans, all those wonderful things that you guys are entitled to. I, I think they deserve I completely, it. You absolutely you deserve willing, it. When you sign up for service, you're but saying... People are going to be way more able to give their money to a veteran service before they're going to give it to, to an, an addiction. Exactly. Dude, he can die. And yep. That went back to my argument <laughs> where we were talking about when the comments of, well, if somebody's going to be stupid enough to shoot up heroin or smoke heroin or, or whatever else, then they deserve to die. Uh, yeah, I think that is just one of those things that we have to... We, we can't say it enough. I mean, if you if you want to, if you are that pissed off about the epidemic, if you are that concerned that the state that you're living in is the second highest state in all of the United States of America for the opiate epidemic, if you are that mad about it, 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 it this takes more than just writing into your legislators and, and it just takes more than leaving faxes and voicemails and everything else, which, you know, the resist program, you are spot on on that. However, there's also about taking action. It's about becoming a volunteer. It's about taking five hours every month to go do something that's bigger than you and what you've got going on. And I'm not... If you want I'm a not, better community, you have to invest in it. You can't just be like, I wish somebody would clean up all these fucking drug addicts. Okay, how? about how? you go to a city council meeting and, and, and lobby for a halfway house? I mean, we got a drug court here now. I mean... We're we're getting there, people. We can we can beat this, and we can make a better society. But we have too many people with their head in the sand, and and it just it affects so many things across society. You know the whole epidemic. You know the workforce. 
everything. People getting ahead in life, making bad decisions. You know, it just goes on. Well, just, I think that people just don't, they don't see that. Okay, so what, in my opinion, and I, I, I feel free to prove me wrong. It's, it's cool with that. But if somebody is a heroin addict, now, let's break down the system of the money that you're paying for the Narcan shots. Let's break down the amount of job loss that we have because we're not just losing because of drugs. We're losing because people are literally dying from this. And then we are also, and that and creates overtime, which overtime means an employer is going to have to pay their other employees more money, which then only goes into tired work, which goes into the bad work, which goes into remanufacturing recalls and everything else of having to do something on an item that should have been fine the way it was the very first time around, but it yes. wasn't because somebody is now having to work 50 hours a week instead of 40 hours a week because so-and-so is either getting rehabilitated or they're dead or they're, they're not a consistent worker. So there's right. all these things that go into this that really does break down to our economy. If you don't want to see any more store closings and you don't, and you want to see people thriving jobs and companies and the American economy <clears throat> counts on people being sober. This will affect you at the end of the day. This is how, Everything gets affected. This is how stock markets jump and thrive and whatever else. And yeah, we might go through a hit. If, it's our if, workforce. It's our workforce. And yes, the stock market and the S and P and everything else. That by the way, you don't have enough money to really be invested in. Is the that, company that you work <laughs> for is invested in it? Yeah, you know what I mean. Exactly, so. and it does affect your job. And all these things do affect you at some point. Even if you are saying that not a single cousin. Boyfriend, girlfriend of a cousin's great aunt, mother. I've never mother. been touched by an overdose. Oh, sudden! I've never been touched by the. Oh, first of all, kudos. poverty. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, kudos to you for never having to go through it. But it does affect your everyday single living, and you can be mad about it or you can change it. And you know, Crawford is completely right. You go to your city council meetings. You go into whether it's a Democratic or it's a Republican council meeting. You go in into anything that you see is going on locally. You take. Your time for you take an action. hour. You, you take want to action. see something change? You get you 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 rally around and you find other people who feel the same way. And you know what? Maybe you're the majority and you all go to a city council and you get change. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way. And we have too many people who are just unaffected. Like, well, that's somebody else's job to to make change. I want change, but I don't know who's gonna do it. So, you know, and I think that's where our generation is is coming in. Is 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 people in their 30s i'm 36 you're a little bit younger than me but you know we you, we're by two starting, years i'm yeah, two years younger yeah, let's just calm the woo. horse down woo, woo. <laughs> um i think you know our generation is just now starting to seriously consider getting into politics and and changing things you know finally I mean, right you know thank you guys <laughs> you know, we're finally we have grown up and mm -hmm. you know our kids are starting to get older out of diapers i mean some of my graduating class still having babies but i mean all of us are at different stages in our life. Like, I had my first kid when I was 14, had my second at 22. So, you know, I'm only two years older than you, but I'm getting ready to have my first grandchild. My son's 22. You know, his girlfriend will be 21. I would cry. I'm not even going to lie. I don't know how you are dealing with that. Good. You know what? I And I have always identified with people who are about 10 years older than me. Yeah. You know, like, mature-wise, is, is that's where... So, you know, in, in 10 years, that would be about the right age for a grandma. I'm 30. I just turned 36 last month, just like two weeks, three weeks ago. And, uh, yeah. I, but, you know, it is what it is. That's awesome, and, and, though. But I'm okay with it because Get I it raised... Get it done and out of the way so you don't have to worry about it when you are in your 50s. You know, Shit. exactly. <laughs> I have, I, by the time I'm 40, you know, my youngest is 13. By the time I'm 40, my kids will be raised. And with longevity and how long people are living, I still have a very long time to do what I want. So I struggled and I did a lot. But going back to, you know, we're all at different stages in our life and what we can contribute and do. Um, I'll be free, you know, of, of motherhood and be moving into my next phase of life very soon. Whereas you have, what, 10 years ago? Yeah. I mean, before your kids are out of the house. Yep. I mean, 15, maybe 15 before you'll be a grandma. I mean, and we're only two years apart, but that's how different, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? That is, that is how different our lives are. And then, like I said, we have people who are, just now having babies. So, you know, and I have people who had kids when they were in their early 20s. And, you know, I have people who have teenagers now and they'll be, you know, but we're starting to take issues more seriously. Like, okay, what am I going to do in the next phase of our life? In a few years, your kids will be off and teenagers and won't need you all the time. You'll have more time to dedicate to local action or whatever. And so I think that's why we have all these 
50, 60, 70, 80 year olds who always dominate our countries because they ain't got nothing else to fucking do. They really don't. They're you not, know? they're not, and they're not struggling the way that we're struggling. No, and trying to prove that point, I think, has always been a really hard thing for me to do because it's like they don't get it. It's like no. you don't understand how different things are for yeah, us. It's, it, it, impossible. It's, it's impossible. And you, you can show stats, you can show figures, you can say, hey, you know, 35 years ago, you were paying a. Uh, yeah, you were paying like a seven uh, a seven percent interest rate on your house when I'm only paying like three point five. However, our house is the exact same house thirty years ago. Yours is worth you know forty thousand dollars, and mine's worth a hundred and twenty. You know, like right or ninety five thousand dollars. Like, but that makes a difference. Where right. you know, at the end of the day, you could probably with some hard work and dedication, really actually get your house paid off in fifteen years. Yeah, you know, and yeah. well, that'd you be nice. Get, I'd love to do that. Yeah, you that'd know? be great. But I'm like, I would ah. work my ass off. Yep, and I'm like, and, just and, give me the opportunity. <laughs> and there's none. There are none for our generation. Exactly, at all. and I mean, there is, but it, it takes so much it takes a lot of the resource so much effort and, and so much and oh by the way when you can and you have to but you should go back to school okay so i have to go back to school That's i the, need to do this yeah. i need to work two jobs and pay my bills and raise my kids tell me don't get me wrong i don't mind hard work and sacrifice but i mean i'm talking on an impossible level of yeah. hard work and sacrifice there's a limit to yep. what you should have to hard work and sacrifice <laughs> this ain't fucking china people <laughs> you know what i mean i yep. should be able to see my kids as they're growing up not you know just upsetting me you know exactly where i think that it's uh you know um one of those things where it's it's so difficult to uh make other people understand but we could talk about you know financials and, and difference of generations time and time again yeah. but right now our generation is trying to take care of I the addictions we're trying right. to we're, we're trying to hit everything that we um we put underneath the rug all the things that we squandered down. Why are we more affected? Why are millennials sad? Why are, you know, whatever the, the story may be or where is the work ethic at? And I think a lot of it just comes to how are you able to cope? Because there's some of us who are born brick as nails and we were taught like, do not be a little bitch and you are going to suck it up and you are going, I don't care, right. suck it up and make do with what you have. Right. And it's like, you look at me and, and my three other siblings, we have, all raised under the same roof all raised under the same marriage our parents like didn't divorce and get remarried you know right. they had their moments but like they were always together so i have two parents who are together we all live in the same house everybody was raised underneath the same morals the same way all four of us are completely different people right. across the board because we all take things on differently we're all what you know whether it's narcissism or selfishness or depression or or addiction or whatever it is about us that is different we're all different and it it, it, it has changed and there's no exact reason i'm not looking for a, a pinpoint of that's you, called this nature is, versus nurture yeah and i love that argument but I think to wrap up what we were saying about the opiate epidemic is that it, it, what needs to change uh, alongside with legislation and the news articles and the activism and people talking about it is it has to be a community coming together to want to change it. Yep. And we're that kind of community that's happening. And however we turned out this way is how we turned out. And so now we're working on the aspect of no matter who we are, we're all finding a way that maybe the world is not just about us. And it's right. not just about our family and our like just our direct neighborhood that this is a statewide community-wide start in the village make it to the you know bigger than a village now it's a community now, now it's, it's a city regional. Now, now it's regional yep. state yeah well, you know now you just say no was a big thing and you know oh, we can so make big. this happen but it doesn't have to be a just say no but we need to say just say yes to hugging the addict next to you and mm -hmm. accepting them for who they are and maybe you know giving them a job and a chance and maybe changing just, their life you know and we're only as strong as our weakest link, and we're becoming a much weaker country because we don't want to do anything for the weak of this nation. Yep. So. Spot on. I think that's all we have for this episode uh, about opiate addiction. Hopefully you enjoyed your, I don't know how long this ran, <laughs> hour and a half. We'll see what it edits down to, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us.